We're going to talk about 11 game development pitfalls and how you can avoid them coming up. What's up, guys? My name is Tim Russwick, and if you're new here, I want you to consider subscribing because we post daily game development videos just like this one. And while I'm talking, why don't you go ahead and leave me a comment on what you think the number one game development pitfall is down below. But let's get to it. Pitfall number one is making something you're not passionate about. So this is something we've discussed a lot on the channel. I think passion is super important, but it's also one of those things that you hear about everywhere in, in articles, in blog posts, in uh, Facebook posts, and all kinds of stuff. You hear, hey, you have to make something you're passionate about. It sounds like cliche advice, but here's the deal. It actually has a benefit. There's actually a legit benefit to being passionate about something. And that is, it will carry you through when shit gets hard. Game development is gonna get hard. Your project is gonna get hard. There are gonna come times when you feel down and you don't wanna work on your project. There are gonna come times where you feel depressed and you feel burnt out and you feel like you never wanna touch your project again. And if you don't have that passion, you won't be able to carry through. If this project isn't important to you, if it's not something you really, 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 really wanna do, you're not gonna be able to carry through. So passion is super important, not just from like a, you know, hey, I'm passionate kind of perspective, but also from like a logistic, get shit done kind of perspective as well. Pitfall number two, not starting small. So a lot of game developers, when they first get into the business, when they first get into the, game development, they wanna say, hey, I wanna build a giant epic MMO with dragons and tigers and dinosaurs and robots and they just go crazy and there's nothing wrong with building big games right it's just one when you're new to game development it's really hard to gauge how long that'll take you so you know you could be scoping out a project that could take 10 20 years if you're working by yourself but two it's really discouraging when you work on something for so long and you don't get anywhere and on 10-year projects or five-year projects or even two-year projects you can work for a very long time and not get anywhere on those projects. And so it's really important that you start small. Not saying that you can't add any of that stuff, but you have to start small. You have to start with the playable version, with the prototype, with a vertical slice, with something small. Cut out, you know, if you have 100 features, try try doing it with two features. Try If you have 1,000 weapons, try it with one weapon. Build the basic version. Build the, the, the minimal viable game and go from there. There's nothing wrong with adding all that stuff. You just have to make sure that you start small and that you get a playable version as early as possible. Pitfall number three, building an engine, not a game. So straight up, if you want to build a game engine, build a game engine. But if you want to make a game, make a game. Don't try and make a game engine if you want to make a game. I did that when I started. The first thing I thought is, hey, I need to build a game engine. I spent years working on this top-down 2D platformer engine. I built a whole editor. I built an entity system. I built all kinds of tools and stuff. And I got so burnt out, I never actually built the game. So straight up, build the game, work on the game. Think about the game that you wanna make if you wanna be a game developer. Don't worry about the technology because there's so many engines out there that you can use, there's so many tools, there's so many things and resources and assets that you can actually use at your disposal to make games. You don't have to roll your own tech anymore. Back in the day, you used to have to, but you don't have to anymore. So make games, not technology. It's as easy as that. Pitfall number four, building based on difficulty. So back in the day when I was learning programming, uh, one of the things that I would do a lot is I would build things that I thought would be really difficult for me to program. And I would be super excited to build these things and I would spend weeks, sometimes months trying to build these different pieces of code. And then I would show people and they'd be like, eh, it's cool. And I'd be like, what do you mean? What do you mean? I spent months on this. They didn't really care for it because the feature that I was building didn't really make sense for the game. I just built it because it was technically challenging. And I've also done the opposite. I've also been super lazy and like, hey, I have this idea for like this laser system or this big weapon. And I'm like, yeah, but that'll be difficult to program. So I'm gonna do this other thing and just make a compromise and make the easier version. And the same thing happens, right? Like it's not right for the game and because you added it for the wrong reason or you did it the wrong way, uh, it doesn't come out right. So build things that need to be in the game don't try and build them because they're challenging. Don't try and build them because they're easy. Uh, build them because they need to be in the game and build them the right way for the game. It's hard to figure that out sometimes, but it's up to every creator to really figure out what things need to be in the game and what things don't. Pitfall number five, not having a target audience. So Tim, shouldn't this be in a marketing video? Yeah, probably. 
target audiences are super important to marketing, but it's also important to development because one of the things that I've run into a lot is I've made games where I have testers that have different play styles or different preferences. Some like exploration, some like precision platforming. And if I give them both the same game to play, they're going to both give me different feedback depending on what they like. So if I don't have a target audience and I don't know which one of these players is actually my target audience and I listen to feedback from both, I'm going to end up making a convoluted game that doesn't make sense. Really what I should do is I say this is a precision platforming game and it's for precision platformers or this is an exploration game and it's for people that like exploration games. And I should pick those as my target audience. That way I make sure what I'm delivering is, is perfect for the person that I'm giving it to. Uh, if it's not, you end up with just a bunch of opinions, not actual real feedback when you're getting feedback. So it's important to pick a target audience early in development and make sure that your testers and the people you're working with uh, to test the game are part of that market. Like it, there's nothing wrong with having testers outside of that market. Just make sure that you understand the difference between someone who plays the type of games that you are making and someone who doesn't. And a lot of times people that don't play your type of game can give you valid feedback, but just keep that in mind when it comes to things like uh, the, the core mechanics or the, the things that are in every type of game and stuff like that. If, if that kind of stuff comes up, that's something you have to make a decision on. Pitfall number six, getting lost in feature frenzy. So I have a lot of programmer friends, I have a lot of startup friends, and a lot of them call this kitchen sinking it basically adding in any feature that you can think of. And a lot of times when game developers, like especially newer developers, let's say they're making a platformer, their first idea is like, oh, this would be cool with anti-gravity. Oh, this would be cool with big machine guns. Oh, this would be cool with, you know, these other features. And they, they just add a bunch of stuff in from a bunch of different games that they played. And they think that they're making progress on their game. They're not actually designing and developing their game. They're just adding a bunch of stuff. Kitchen syncing it or adding up in Feature Frenzy is not a good idea because you just end up adding a bunch of stuff that really doesn't belong in the game. This comes up in development and it's a development pitfall because oftentimes when we're making our game, when we're building our game, even if we've designed stuff beforehand, it can get really tedious and boring. And sometimes our brains want to be stimulated a little bit more. So we want to come up with new cool stuff. We want to build a cool thing. We want to play around with a new system. We don't necessarily want to do all the old boring code uh, that's not going to get us anywhere visually. So it, it makes sense that we want to add features, but you really got to stop yourself from adding features or you can end up in feature frenzy and just never get out of it. Pitfall number seven, reinventing the wheel. So if something's been done before, there's no reason that you have to redo it all over again. If you're making a procedurally generated game, for example, there's no reason why you can't look up procedural generated algorithms. There's no reason why you can't look up how different games did their procedural generation. There's no reason why you can't play other games and really observe and how they did things. You don't have to invent everything yourself. You can pull from things outside of you. You can pull from things uh, in the industry. You can pull from things in the genre and you can put all of this together and really make something that's awesome. If you spend all your time trying to create something new, you can end up with stuff that doesn't work. You can end up with stuff that's confusing. You can end up with stuff that just like is doesn't resonate with the players. Not only that, but it takes way longer to get some of this stuff in. If you can use an algorithm out there uh, instead of invent your own and it works, like what's the difference? Why would you spend all the time trying to design something and, you know, put all that work into it if something else out there already works? Same thing goes with code or music or art. Or whatever. I'm not saying that you shouldn't put effort in those things because you absolutely should. And if your game requires that you make those things custom and specific, go for it. But there's no reason to reinvent the wheel over and over again. If there's stuff out there that's already done that you can use, why not use that? Pitfall number eight, optimizing too early. So as a programmer, I resonate with this a lot. <laughs> there's so many times where I'm developing a game and I like will look over my function or something and I'll say, hey, this this is bad. This is coded badly and I need to recode it. Hey, this is slow and I need to make it faster. Hey, there's a quick frame drop right here. I need to investigate the issue. And yeah, maybe all of those things need to happen, right? But they don't need to happen in the beginning or the early middle of your project. They need to happen at the end. 
That's when you optimize all the code. That's when you refactor stuff. That's when you perfect stuff. Because while you're building, so many things change. So many things like get moved around and shuffled and, and iterated on. And if you optimize stuff and then it gets iterated on, it's not optimized anymore. And you have to go back and optimize it. And not only that, but you can get stuck on that optimization loop. You can get stuck on the refactoring. You can, you can end up in that perfectionism loop that just keeps you doing nothing really and just recoding things that are already there. And I know I do this a lot and I'm really trying to stop myself from doing it because it stops me so many times from making progress on my project because I'm just recoding and refactoring and and redoing stuff that is already done. And I, I constantly want to optimize, but I've made a rule for myself where I have to build the thing first. I have to get it all working. And only once something's finalized, which is at the 70, 80, 90% mark of a project, uh, that's when the optimization comes in. And it seems to work well for me. Pitfall number nine, shiny object syndrome. So as creative people, we like to create. And the problem with creating is that like when you start on a bigger project and you're creating it for a long time, it gets boring and you get that urge to start something new. But jumping ship and going on to a new project leaves that project abandoned. And if you get in the habit of that, you can jump from project to project to project. That's called shiny object syndrome. And it's something that plagues a lot of creative people because there's so many people that don't finish their things. This was me my entire life up until the last year and a half, two years, when I decided to become a finisher because I just couldn't finish any project that I started. And I actually did this thing called Finish Friday where I finished eight games eight weeks in a row uh, live on stream because I wanted to prove to myself that I could become a, a finisher. And the whole idea was I was gonna pick a project off my hard drive, I was gonna finish it live on stream, Stream, uh, or if I didn't finish it, I was going to delete it. Complete it or delete it was the tagline. Luckily, we finished all eight projects and it was awesome and I learned a lot. And since then, I've made the pledge to finish anything that I start. And it makes me second guess the things that I start, right? Because I know I have to finish it. It also makes me start small. It also makes me, you know, really think about the things that I'm about to start because finishing it is going to be a requirement. And I wish more creative people would finish the things that they start because that's how you get places. That's how you move forward. That's how you progress in life. Shiny object syndrome stops you from doing that. So be very careful when you're about to stop a project and start a new one and ask yourself, is this shiny object syndrome? Pitfall number 10 is getting too attached. So this happens a lot on longer projects. It's definitely happening with me right now in my project. I've been working on it so long, I'm so engrossed in it, I'm so knee deep in it that it's really hard for me to tell what things are fun anymore. And it's, I get hypersensitive sometimes about what people have to say about it. I ignore people, I ignore feedback sometimes from people because I'm so deep in it and so emotionally attached to the project. Uh, I can ignore really good advice and really good feedback. And this happens on project basis, but it also happens on an idea or a feature basis as well. Sometimes you really like something in your game or something that you built, some feature, some art piece, some music, and it might not fit. And you might get a lot of feedback that it, it doesn't fit. And you're emotionally attached to it, right? So you don't want to change it, but you got to take a step back and really figure out like whether or not it needs to be there, whether or not this is the thing that makes for the best scene or atmosphere or whatever you're going for. Getting too attached is dangerous because you lose clarity. And when you lose clarity, you can't tell what's good or bad anymore. And so you have to be really careful when that starts happening, when you get attached to a project or you get attached to something in a project that you're not losing that clarity. And it helps to constantly test stuff. It helps to have people to give you feedback and it helps to have honest people around you that will tell you uh, when you're slipping up. I've been lucky enough to have the Game Dev Underground, which is awesome community. And it's, it's been great. They've been helping me out with my project a lot. So if you need feedback like this, you can join our Discord. Uh, we have a beautiful community that's on 24 seven and they would love to give you feedback or help you out in your project. And pitfall number 11, going at it alone. This is something I preach all the time on the channel because I feel like there's so many solo developers and I know what that's like. I'm a solo developer. I make games by myself. But it's really, really, really important that you get other people involved in your project. And I don't mean that you need a partner or a musician or an artist or somebody to actually partner with. Sometimes I just need people to talk to. Like, I just need people to show my project to. I just need people to give me feedback or ideas or bounce ideas off of. Uh, and it can be as simple as that, or it can be hiring someone to do the stuff that you're not good at. It can be working with someone and trading, you know, your skill sets so that maybe you, you could work on their game and they could work on your game. 
and you guys can kind of trade what you're good at. But going at it alone by yourself in your room or in your office just can get so lonely and it can get depressing and you can go in downspouts and just not want to work on your project anymore. And you can really lose sight of the, the, the goal. You can lose sight of the objective and you can kind of lose a little bit of that passion if you're in solitude all the time, if you're just completely away from people. So going at it solo, I actually think is, is a big pitfall because we need people. We are social creatures as human beings. And I say that as an introvert, right? Like I have, I've had social anxiety. I know what that's like to be afraid to talk to people. I, <laughs> believe me, but it's needed. It's, it's part of the project. You need other people to succeed. And if you don't have those other people, uh, you're going to have a really rough time, both like actually carrying through and finishing with the project, but also, you know, just mentally, you can lose clarity a lot easier when you, when you are working alone as well. And that's all I got for you guys on this video. If you like it, please give me a thumbs up. Leave me your thoughts in the comments down below. And like I said, we post daily game development videos on this channel. So hit the subscribe button and the bell if you want to hear more from me. I also have a free ebook called 67 Tips for Game Development Design and Marketing. The link for that is in the description down below. It's completely free, so I recommend you grab that. But once again, my name is Tim Ruswick, and I'll see you again tomorrow.